Hello everyone, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depends on where you are. Uh, welcome to this uh, AI seminar, uh, which is hosted by uh, Technology Innovation Institute, uh, TII in, in Abu Dhabi. I'm uh, Dr. Daniel da Costa, uh, currently a principal researcher at TII. And for today, it's a big pleasure for us uh, to have a uh, uh, Dr. Gabriel Peira uh, as the speaker of our AI seminar. Uh, the talk uh, will be about optimal transport and uh, is a very interesting subject. Actually, uh, that it, uh, I mean, it's in the section of various fields and uh, it includes probability theory, uh, geometry, optimization theory, and so on. So, uh, but before we move to the talk, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Gabriel Peyher. So Dr. Gabriel Peyher is currently a senior researcher at uh, CNRS in France, and also a professor at the Ecole Normale Superiore in Paris. Uh, he works at the interface between applied mathematics, image and machine learning. Uh, he obtained uh, two ERC grants, one in 2010 and consolidated in 2017. Uh, the Blaise Pascal Prize from the French Academy of Science in 2017, the Magens Prize from the Italian Mathematical Union in 2019, and the Silver Medal from CRS in 2021. He was invited speaker at the European Congress for Mathematics in 2020, he is Deputy Director of the Pride Institute for Artificial Intelligence, the Director of, uh, of the ENS Center for Data Science, and the former Director of the GDR CNRS MIE. And he is currently the Head of the European Lab for Learning and Intelligent System in Paris University. So, uh, Dr. Gabriel Payhead, thank you very much again for for your time and your availability to give this talk. And now uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thanks Daniel. So it's a pleasure to be here since I'm hosting my talk. I would make a, a tutorial slash uh, introduction talk to, to optimal transport and explain a bit uh, this interface with uh, machine learning. So please uh, stop me. You can ask questions during the talk uh, whenever you want. Just stop and uh, I'll be happy to take questions during the talk uh, if anything is not clear. Um, I'd like to convey the general idea, what are the take-home message of this uh, like type of tools, rather than going too much into the, the technical details. Uh, also, if you want to know the technical details, the mathematics and uh, also the algorithm, you can go to this web page where we have a, a small book we have written with uh, Marco Cuturi, my collaborator. Uh, it's a free PDF, so you can just uh, download it for free, so don't hesitate. Before starting, uh, what is uh, like the motivation, I would say? The motivation is to tackle problems where you model uh, basically the data as a probability distribution, or if you want like some like, huge point clouds in some space, and you'd like to compare, to transform uh, this type of, of data sets. And it turns out that it's very useful in many fields. Could be in low dimension for image processing or shape matching, shape registration, medical imaging. It's kind of, a, let's say, classical uh, setup. But uh, you could also think about more ambitious problem in high dimension. Uh, typically, the one you would encounter in unsupervised or supervised learnings. I would say one of the key breakthroughs, for instance, of uh, the last five years or so in uh, natural language processing is this idea of vectorizing the, the language. So modern uh, language models that treat language text as a point cloud, basically, where each word would be embedded as a position in space. And then modern architecture, neural networks, they would modify these point clouds. Uh, you can think about like transformers architectures, for instance. Um, another example, more in computer vision, is the idea of uh, modeling a huge collection of, of images as a huge uh, density distribution in some abstract space in order to do uh, later, later on downstream tasks, such as uh, recognition of images or generation of images. And this requires to model this density of images in some sense. So you could say that uh, the, the problem we want to solve is density fitting or template matching in some sense where uh, you have a data set, beta, which is composed of points, a huge number of points, and you want to uh, capture this uh, geometry of this set of points using a template, alpha, 
that depends on some parameter theta, uh, and you like to modify the parameter theta so that your template become as close as possible uh, from the input distribution. It's like a very old, of course, problem in statistics, uh, in shapes, and so on. And you could frame this question as an optimization problem where you want to minimize some discrepancy or distance, capital D, between alpha and beta. And the goal of this talk is to study this type of discrepancy, capital D, that could be used when you want to compare point clouds or probability distribution. And the key insights uh, of the approach we would study together is the idea that in all these problems, the data don't, uh, is not to totally abstract, if you want. It belongs to some embedding space. Could be a Euclidean space where you use the Euclidean metric. Could be a surface where you would use like the geodesic distance on the surface. Or as I mentioned this in natural language processing, there is this idea of vectorization of embedding words in Euclidean space. And you would compare words using this type of Euclidean distance. And for image processing, of course, it's not really well known what is a good distance, but there is also this idea in modern natural um, uh, neural networks uh, method to introduce an adaptive estimation of some distance between images. And uh, this also can be, uh, can be leveraged. So this defines the distance little d between pairs of x and y, pairs of points. And the goal of optimal transport, in some sense, is to lift this uh, little d distance between pairs of points to a distance capital D between groups of points or more generally uh, probability distribution. So you could really think at a higher level if you don't want to understand the mathematics, which is perfectly fine, I would say, is just to, to grasp the idea that optimal transport is a mechanism, is a lifting mechanism, if you want, that goes from points to groups of points. And it lifts, you give me some metric little d, I give you the outputs capital D. Of course, the difficulty, there's no free lunch, is that uh, this is costly, this computation involves solving an optimization problem, so it costs in terms of computation. And also in terms of statistics, this raises a lot of questions about how many points do you need? Do you need 10, 100, 1 billion points to estimate robustly this type of distance? So this raises two, two types of scalability issues. I would say computational scalability, because if you have a lot of points, it costs a lot. And the statistical, um, I would say scalability, how many points do you need in high dimension? And this is the two questions I want to address today. So I would uh, follow a historical route to explain to you what is optimal transport. Of course, it's very old. And it, the birth of optimal transport is this memoir à l'Académie des sciences sur la théorie des déblais et des remblais, which means it's a military application. And uh, that asked uh, Gaspar Monge at the time. Gaspar Monge was a politician, but also a mathematician. He, he survived the revolution. So he had a very, very uh, complex life, I would say. Where he asked the question, you have soldiers that want to move points or move sands because it was for military application, move piles of sand from location XI to location YJ. And you want this in order to minimize the total travel distance, which is, of course, a very complicated uh, combinatorial optimization problem because you would have to look for all possible permutation, all possible connection, sigma, between the XI and the YJ. So you can say that this is an easy problem to state, but apparently very hard to, 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 to solve. And, and Gaspar Monch was not able to solve the problem. So you had to wait a lot of time, a lot of mathematical uh, advances in order to be able to understand how to solve efficiently this problem. But the problem is interesting and it makes sense that a lot of problems could be phrased as, as trying to measure the, the somehow uh, cost induced by traveling between two sets of points. Uh, so as I already said, this it's intractable. There's too many permutations. And also, I mean, it's very basic, basic remark, but what do you do if you don't have the same number of points? Which makes total sense because for us, as I said before, the data set don't have the same number of points. And you could even consider problems where one data set has a finite number of points and your model has actually an infinite number. It's like a continuous model. So how do you deal with it? So this is what I want to explain. Now, what is the modern formulation? Uh, the first revolution, I would say, in the history of optimal transport. And this revolution is actually due to Leonid Kantorovich who was involved during the Second World War to, um, how do you say this, to, uh, to work on, uh, on transshipment problem, to optimize the transshipment of goods to soldiers, also for military, I would say, initial uh, goals. But very quickly, Kantorovich got interested into economic modeling. So the ultimate goal of, of Leonid Kantorovich was to do planification of economy in the sense that you have production, like workers and so on, and consumption, consumers, and you want to link them in an optimal way. Okay, and of course, it was a big issue. I would say it's like uh, at the time of communism, it was the idea of planification of economy, but in fact, it was quickly embraced by capitalism because it's also at the heart of capitalism. And in some sense, it's somehow the birth 
of, uh, I would say, modern mathematical econometry, so the, the study of economic from a mathematical perspective. And it's also the birth of modern optimization. So it's the birth of many things at the same time. Uh, and what is the genius of Kantorovich with respect to Gaspar Monge? And also it's because of this that he got the, actually the Nobel Prize in economy for this discovery, is the idea that you should allow yourself to split the mass. Because a good notion is not points that will move, it's the mass that you want to distribute. Can be mass of production, can be mass of sand, can be mass of whatever. So basically we are dealing actually with a probability distribution. So here, I would speak only about discrete probability distribution, just to simplify the, the mathematics. But everything that I would say works, even if you have an infinite number of, of, of points, if you have a continuous density, in which case you simply replace the sum by integrals, but that's pretty much it. But for the sake of concreteness, I would study discrete problems, which means you have discrete points, x, i, n, y, j, and each point, it carries a mass, if you want a measure, in some sense, which is AI for alpha and BJ for, for beta. And for the sake of simplicity, I would assume, of course, they are positive number, and it's probability normalized. And we have made several uh, contributions in my team, for instance, and other teams to extend this to more general case and probability distribution, but I would not have time to speak about it. So let's assume we have two discrete probability distribution. And the genius of Kantorovich was to say that we will describe the movement of mass the transshipment or the planification, if you want, for, for Kantorovich, he calls this a transport plan. Sometimes, I mean, for probability theorists, it's called a coupling, which is just a big matrix, capital P. So if you have N element in A and M element in B, you have N times M element in capital P. So it's a, it's a huge matrix. And each time you put a non-zero element, so here a purple dot in this matrix, it, is, it means you transfer some mass between A and B. So you see all the arrow on the upper right, it corresponds to non-zero element in this array. And you, you really already see the big novelty, the revolution, conceptual revolution. It's, it's not hard, but it's conceptually very deep. Is since in the second row, for instance, you have two non-zero dots, there is actually two arrows that would emerge and goes from the left to the right. So it's nice because now you can couple uh, as many points as you want. You don't need to have the same number of points. What do we need to impose on this uh, coupling matrix, on this transport plan? We need to impose a conservation of mass, namely that all the mass from the left gets distributed to the right and it's symmetric, so all the mass gets received on the right. Which means that when you sum the element on the rows, so sum on j of pi j, you should get back ai, you should get back the initial mass. And the same, of course, on the column, if you sum on the column. So in terms of, of equation, the way I would write it usually is capital P time one should be equal to a, because if you do capital P time a vector full of one, you're just, of course, summing on the rows. Okay, so you, you see, why is it nice? Why is it beautiful? It's because you have positivity and only linear, linear constraints. So you have uh, somehow trades this huge fact, factorial exponential number of permutation against a more simple description of the set of strategies, which is just a convex set, a polytop of possible transport plans. And now the most problems become Kantorovich problems, which is the idea of selecting the optimal uh, coupling. And the big assumption of Kantorovich, which somehow extends the idea of Munch, is, and it is an assumption, it's a very strong assumption, is if you double the amount of mass you want to transfer, you should double the price, which means that each time you, um, you transfer some amount of mass Pij, you pay a price, which is Pij times some cost. And for instance, the cost, and it's usually the case, is the power P of some distance. So for Munch, it was P equal one, but you can take any P, basically. Um, and then you sum all the contribution and you get the total cost you want to minimize. And why is it so simple and so beautiful? It's because this function is just a linear function of capital P. So this is what is often called a linear program. You minimize a linear function under linear equations and positivity constraints. And as I say, it's really the birth of um, modern optimization and uh, starting the discovery of algorithm to, to solve this problem. So Kantorovich actually didn't work on the algorithm. And I think the researcher that should be credited for actually providing the first algorithm for this is uh, George Danzig, which in the four, late 40s, I would say, worked and derived the famous simplex algorithm. And I would come back to this, but it turned out that there are some simplex algorithms, which are often called network simplex algorithms, which are super efficient for this problem. And by super, I mean, it's really half empty, uh, the glass that is half empty of half, half full, it's n cube algorithm. So basically, the complexity of solving this problem, if n is equal to m, is n cube time log n square. But roughly speaking, it's, it's cubic time. 
which cubic is good for like maybe five or so thousand points, but if, if n becomes super large and it starts to be to be problematic. So this is what I want to explain after how you go below n cube by doing some approximation. Uh, but this is a great discovery and everybody starts using it. And then uh, Kantorovic got the Nobel Prize. He derived also duality theory. So it's become huge in mathematics and, and, and it starts the ball rolling up to now where we are now. But really the starting point is this joint discovery, I would say, of Kantorovic and Danzig of the idea of uh, efficient uh, linear programming for, 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 for planification of economic and of course of later of, of different other fields. But it's fair to say that the initial impact is mostly in economics. Uh, but there is more to this. I think if we, if we stop here, we don't really see why it's important. Because it's useful, of course, for economic. You get this nice uh, transport plan, so you can do interpolation, you can do nice things. But it's more, more than this. It's the fact that actually not only the, the, the p itself is important, but the value of the optimization problem. If you take the optimal p, you compute the cost, and you raise it to the power 1 over p, is defining a distance, which is often called the Wasserstein distance, which you've probably heard of because it's quite a popular distance in probability. It has many names, Munch Kantorovich distance, Hearst mover distance, and so on. But it's the same distance, which is just the cost raised to the power one over p. So first of all, it's a distance, which is not obvious from, from the equation, which means it's zero if and only if a equal b, which is kind of obvious because if it's zero, the coupling is diagonal. So you could uh, see that a is equal to b. But it also satisfies the triangular inequality, which is not totally obvious. But you might argue, OK, I know tons of other distances, such as, which are much more simple than this one. So why uh, should I buy this new distance instead of my favorite one, L1, L2, or, or whatever? Well, the important point here is this distance is geometric. It's a distance that carries a new way to compare probability distribution. So I want to pause for a minute and explain what I mean by this. And when you have a distance, I mean, a simple way, a mathematical way to express this geometry or what, what is it do, really doing is to look at uh, the notion of, 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 of topology, if you want, of what does it mean for two probability measures to be close in terms of optimal transport. And it turns out that the answer is often called, at least in probability, uh, the convergence in law. I mean, it has many names, but on a compact domain, I mean, they all correspond to a uh, I mean, similar notion, I would say, of convergence in law in, in, in um, often called narrow convergence, actually, in probability. And in math, in analysis, it's often called also the weak topology, the weak star convergence. It simply corresponds to saying that a sequence of, of distribution alpha n, of, of distribution, probability distribution of densities, if you want, converges to a target uh, beta if and only if all possible integrals that you could compute converges. So you see, it's not a, a, a direct convergence. It doesn't mean that a function converge to another one or a vector converge to another one. It's, it's really the idea of looking at convergence through the prisms of continuous function. So in probability, it means all possible expectation converges. If you look at what does it mean for all possible continuous integrals to converge, it really means that the Dirac or the location of, of, of the mass has to come closer and closer together. This is really what I mean by, by this idea of geometric convergence. And, 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 and the key property, which is a fundamental theorem, or the most fundamental theorem of optimal transport, is the fact, as I already said, that it's a distance, but that it metrizes uh, this topology of the convergence in law, which means that a sequence converges in law to another one, if and only if the Wasserstein distance converges. Okay? And, and, and it, of course, it's not the only one, but it's really a nice, uh, a, a nice distance that has this favorable property of metrizing, quanti quantifying, if you want, the convergence in law. If you really want to, to see even simpler what, why is it nice or why is it a soft notion of convergence, just look at what happened with a single Dirac. So if you want a deterministic uh, random vector that always assumes the same value at some point xi, um, and this, this Dirac shifts progressively toward this finite position delta x. If you compute the simplest, I would say, uh, distance between probability distribution is going to be the L1 norm. So the L1 norm, which is often called uh, total variation distance has many names, but it's basically the L1 norm. You take two densities and you compute the L1 uh, distance. Uh, what is the L1 norm between two Dirac? Well, if the Dirac are not exactly at, at the same position, you get a plus one and you get a minus one at another position because you make the subtraction of the two and then you compute the L1 norm, plus one and minus one, it's make a total variation norm or L1 norm equal to two. So in terms of, of, of total variation, which is often called the strong topology, 
natural topology, if you want, the one that comes in hand immediately, to Dirac never converges to one each other because it doesn't take into account this L1 uh, norm, the shift or the relative position between the Dirac. Now, if you look at what happened for optimal component, it's, it's exactly the opposite because there is only one way to, to, to transfer a Dirac to another one. And since you write to the power P and then to the power one over P, you discover that the Wasserstein distance is equal to the distance itself. And you can in fact prove that the Wasserstein distance is the only one that has this very nice uh, lifting mechanism, I already employed this term before, but it's really a lifting mechanism, that if you evaluate the distance, the Wasserstein distance on pairs of Dirac, you get back the original Dirac. Okay, so you see it matches exactly the initial dis distance on Dirac, and then you can compute this for arbitrary pairs of Dirac and say how they close or not to one each other. Maybe another, uh, after we will we'll have motivation for machine learning, but I would say maybe a, uh, a motivation for mathematicians is, is if you know about the central limit theorem, central limit theorem that says that some average of, of independent random vectors, they converge to a Gaussian, is exactly about this idea of convergence in law. It's a theorem of convergence in law, because with uh, typically you, you can have a discrete set of random vectors, like you do a binary random vector, you average them, so you get binary random, uh, discrete random vector, sorry that converges toward the continuous limit, which is, a, which is the, Wasserstein, the Gaussian distribution. So the same would apply here, that in terms of total variation norm, uh, central limit theorem is not true. A discrete distribution is always at distance equal to two to a continuous distribution. But for the Wasserstein distance, then you can study how fast does the central limit theorem goes to convergence, and it's really nice. It's called Berry-SN theory, and then you get a lot of nice theorems. And I don't know if you want theorem, but it's very nice. And you see why. So now it's becoming useful is because you have a way to quantify to quantify the notion of of, of convergence. You, know, you cannot only say it converges. You can say at what speed is my model good or not good. So it's really a nice tool to quantify for theoreticians, but also for practitioners. Are two random vectors close or not close? Even if they are discrete, you could still say things which you cannot with the L1 norm. With the L1 norm, you cannot consider discrete distribution against continuous one. Okay, I hope you're following me. I hope you, 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 you see the point. The point is really having a very flexible tool, a geometrical tool. I would go quickly on this. It's just like to, to insist a bit on type of algorithm you could find. And I would, of course, explain my algorithm. I mean, the one I use after, but there is a plenty of algorithms. The most simple one is just linear programming. So just use simplex, it's n log n, uh, n, n cube log n, but okay, it works up to a few thousand. In the specific case where the two distributions are discrete on the same number of points with uniform distribution, which is much problem before, in fact, there is a very famous theorem by Birkhoff and von Neumann that prove that actually by solving Kantorovich problems, which as you remember, can allow yourself to split the mass. In fact, there is always a solution that is a solution to most problem, which means that you always have a permutation that is optimal for Kantorovich problems, which is a very deep result because it shows that in n cube roughly operation, you can actually solve a most problems. So you see, it's why I say that it requires almost uh, 200 years of, of, of theory to, to finally arrive to the a solution, I would say, that is efficient. And I see there are some questions on the chat. So maybe uh, let me read. How does it extend to convergence in probability? So this is not convergence in probability. So it's a, it's a weaker form. I think that convergence in probability under some hypothesis implies uh, convergence in law, but the converse is not true. Okay, so it's it's a it's a softer, even softer, I would say, a notion of convergence. There is a, so you have almost show convergence that is a L1 convergence. So it's it's like pointwise convergence. It's a very strong convergence. Then you have convergence in probability, and then you get convergence in law, where in fact, in convergence in law, it's a very, very weak notion of convergence. The random vector are not even defined on, on the same space, on the same probability space. All right, so let's go back to the algorithm. There is one case that is simpler, in, is in 1D. In 1D, computing optimal transport is very simple because you can do it by assigning the point from left to right, by sorting them. So optimal transport is always monotonic in 1D. So in this case, uh, it's n log n basically because you just need to solve the points. So it's only in one D, so it's kind of <laughs> kind of restricted. I would go so quickly on this, but for those who want to know more, you can read the book. Uh, there is a special case for the Euclidean norm cost, which is the Euclidean distance, so on Euclidean space, of course. 
When P is equal to one, you get a nice formulation in terms of vector fields. So you can compute optimal vector field that would advect uh, the mass progressively. Um, but it's once again very restricted. But in this case, you have a more efficient algorithm because you can compute on graphs, for instance. You can discretize uh, on a graph and compute the flow on the graph. A very nice uh, algorithm. Something else that I don't have the time to explain, but for those who are interested into partial differential equation, there is a very nice uh, connection, I would say, between optimal transport on one side, uh, partial differential equation, in particular what is called mont jean equation, which is a very famous equation from physics, which can be uh, used to solve optimal transport, and also dynamical system, dynamical evolution of, of, of densities uh, through the work of Benamou Brunier, which is also a typical, I would say, uh, PDE, or at least a conservation of mass equation that you can solve. And then you can use specific tools from PDE, like typically, um, typically uh, finite element or finite difference schemes. But once again, it's very restricted and it only works in low dimension. And the last point that I like a lot, actually, I'm almost in love with this type of methods that are so beautiful. Um, it's called a semi-discrete settings where you want to map a continuous distribution, for instance, here, a Gaussian, toward a discrete distribution. In this case, you can show that the optimal transport is acting like an optimal quantization method, which means that the optimal transport would be constant by parts. And it will typically take a cell of, 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 of continuous distribution of mass and crunch it into a, a, a Dirac. So all you have to do is to compute the geometry of these cells. And it turns out that when the cost is the square of the Euclidean distance, uh, in this case, and in this case only, the boundary of the cell are actually Voronoi cells. You can compute Voronoi cells which you can do very efficiently in low dimension, like in two or three D. And in, in two or three dimension, these are by far the most efficient methods, okay? And, uh, and the specialist is, uh, is on one side, I would say, Quentin Merigo at Orsay, he has a very nice uh, paper. And on the algorithmic side, it's Bruno Levy, who is now at Nancy, he's the boss actually of INRIA Nancy, a big, big lab. And uh, he has a very efficient solver. He told me it works up to dimension four and could work also in dimension five, but it starts to be very complicated. But in low dimension, this is like really, really efficient. Another question, I think one question that at least you could clearly see from this is all these methods, they are, they are efficient and they are computing uh, very accurately optimal transport. Now, I would say for machine learning or for data science, you don't really care about having high precision solution. I mean, in practice, you have a lot of noise in your data. So why would you use a simplex algorithm that would run the, uh, the solution, that would compute the solution to like 10 digits? So it's totally useless. So maybe you'd like an algorithm that is much faster, like maybe n square or something like this, but that would produce errors. Okay, typically, would, would, would not be super, super precise. And this is exactly what I want to present to you now, which is, I mean, many names, but it comes from very old ideas in statistical physics, actually uh, by, by Schrodinger himself, that, there, that then comes to a very old algorithm also. So what is fun is to see that this algorithm they are actually older than optimal transport itself. They were used before optimal transport, like more than 100 years ago, people were already using this algorithm. And the idea is very simple. It comes from an idea of, uh, of Schrodinger himself, which was the idea of modeling actually particles of gas. But uh, you observe the gas as two different times, but you don't know what was the trajectory of the particle of gas. And the idea is you introduce a temperature. So epsilon here is a temperature. And you model the particle of gas not as moving in straight line, as they were doing with, uh, with Gaspar Monge, but as a random uh, trajectories, a random Brownian bridges. And in the paper of, of Schrodinger that you can read, so it's a paper in French, by the way, but if you read French, you can read the paper. He derives the equation and he shows that actually the maximum likelihood estimation process of how, what are the most likely uh, connection between particles of gas, because don't remember that you, you have lost the connection, so you don't know what was happening before, between is actually solving optimal transport, but with a penalty, which is epsilon time, uh, the negative entropy of Shannon. So it's also uh, almost before Shannon, introducing the idea of entropy as a key tool in statistical uh, mechanics. So when epsilon goes to zero, you recover optimal transport. And as you increase the temperature, the particles start moving around and start diffusing a lot. And, and, and the key message, and I would insist on this, is that as the temperature increases, everything becomes a uh, much faster and much simpler. And the way I would say the best way, I mean, unless you are like having the brain of a, of a, a physicist that can understand what happened for particles is to stimul simulate this on the computer. So you take particles of gas here uh, in 2D. You know what, that when epsilon is zero, uh, oops, sorry, what happened? It just crashed, that's okay. Sorry, 
Let's get back to the joke. So when epsilon is zero, you recover optimal transport. And thanks to um, Birkhoff von Neumann, you get a, a permutation connection. So each, you connect one particle of gas to one other particle of gas. But as epsilon increases, and I would explain this just after, you can show, and it's related to maximum entropy method in, in, in statistics, that you get a solution that is strictly positive everywhere. So every particle is get connected to every other particle. So the way I've displayed this to, to really see what's happening is to simply uh, draw a little segment. Each time the connection is strong enough, is stronger than 10 to the minus three. And you see what's happening as you increase the temperature, you get more and more connection. And in fact, in the high temperature limit, and this is what I would explain after, you connect everyone to everyone. So the insight of increasing the temperature, that the particle will move more, is creating more connection. So why is this useful? Uh, it's useful for two things. The first one, and I will see this in the equation after, you get a faster algorithm. As you increase epsilon, people start talking to each other and, and basically the information starts flowing around much, much faster. And the other advantage is creating more connection, creates stability. In fact, as soon as epsilon is strictly positive, you get a strictly convex problem with a unique solution and so on. And stability is very important in high dimension. So it's really the key. If you want to avoid having too many samples, the need of many, many samples in high dimension, you need to have a solution that is very robust to noise because if you don't have enough sample, you have noise and so on. So the two advantages which work hand in hand is the fact that increasing the temperature, heating the, the gas, leads to faster algorithms, so scalability in terms of computation, and leads to uh, more statistical power, leads to things that you can estimate more robustly in high dimension. So it's really the key idea for for this to work in machine learning is increasing epsilon. Okay, um, let's now dive a bit, dive sorry a bit more into the, the equation in order to derive the algorithm. So it would be a, a bit a technical slide, but I've, I hope you would uh, enjoy it and try to understand what is uh, under the hood uh, in terms of algorithm. Because this is a, also a point I want to, to to make is this is an algorithm that anyone can implement. By this I mean that you don't need to be an expert in optimization. Yeah, and any student, like almost like first year student can implement the algorithm, which I think is not the case for simplex or complex optimization method. I think the fact that you have an algorithm that everyone can understand, start to play with it, starts to improve it, makes a huge difference in practice because then everyone can like be happy with it, try to see immediate results and it's nice. And how do you derive this algorithm? I would say you get an optimization problem with two constraints because you need the sum of the rows and the sum of the quorum. So the immediate move you do when you're, you're doing optimization is to look at the optimality condition to introduce Lagrange multipliers for the problem. So you introduce Lagrange multiplier for the first constraint, I call it U, and the Lagrange multiplier for the second constraint, I call it V. Then you do a bit of math, you do Lagrange multiplier theory, so it's very easy. And you obtain this equation, which is the fact that you are solution to the problem if and only if, of course, you satisfy the conservation of math, this doesn't disappear. And you need to be able to write your coupling, capital P, in an exponential format, it's often called a scaling form format, that in introduce uh, the key, I would say, um, element, ingredient, which is the Gibbs kernel. So the Gibbs kernel is typically what you obtain when you get a maximum entropy method. It's going to be exponential of minus the cost divided by epsilon. So think about in the case of Euclidean space and P equal two, it's just going to be a, a gigantic Gaussian matrix. So the Gibbs kernel, you can compute it, you store it on your GPU, and it's a big Gaussian matrix. Now, the question that is raised by, by actually, uh, in some sense, by Schrodinger himself, can you find the scaling factor U and V? Can you scale diagonally, often called like this, because U operate on the rows. You get UI that multiplies the rows and V on the column. So can you scale the rows and the column by scaling factors so that it becomes a, a valid transport plan? And the classical setup is when you get uniform distribution of mass, like for, for the case of the particle of gas, there are equivalent, each particles are the same, so the maths are equal. In case you can take A equal one and B equal one, you have uniform mass. The question is a very fundamental question is, can you scale a, a kernel so that it becomes bistochastic? And believe it or not, but it's a very old question, like in the early 20th centuries, and people actually found this algorithm I will describe to you uh, very early. It's, it's a very, very, very important algorithm that can solve this question. And in fact, if you don't care about an algorithm, I've already found the solution because it's an equivalence, right? So the answer is yes, you can always scale a matrix that is positive so that it becomes bistochastic. And the, and the answer is just because it's an equivalent problem to the above optimization problem, which is itself a strictly convex problem. So it has a unique solution. 
So if you give me a, a positive kernel, a positive interaction matrix, like I don't know, you ask question in the street and you get a matrix of interaction and you want to scale it, uh, you can always and uniquely scale it so that it becomes normalized and be stochastic. So how do you do in practice? And people did this before computing, uh, having computers, so they did this with pen and pencils. Uh, what is the heuristic to find an algorithm? The heuristic is just look at the optimality condition and the scaling condition and introduce the fact that the capital P should be a scaled matrix, right? What becomes the row equation, the row equation, so you multiply by one on the right, like P times one equal A, it becomes this uh, fundamental equation, the, the red equation, which is U dot with a little circle, I would explain what it is, dot with a little circle, time KV equal A. Dot with a little circle is just a multiplication of two vectors, like sometimes called Kronecker product, you just multiply the two vectors and three wise. So it's just classical multiplication of vector. But be, be careful, K time V is really a matrix K time a vector V. So you get a matrix vector multiplication. And of course, you get the second blue equation by just reverting the role of U and V. So you get two equations, which are polynomial of degree two in U and V. So in some sense, Solving optimal transport approximately according to Schrodinger is the same as solving two polynomials of degree two and U and V. But of course, the trick is it's very high dimensional problem. So even if it's a polynomial of degree two, it's still, uh, I mean, it's still challenging. So how do you do this here, at least heuristically? You just take the first equation on the left and you discover that it's super simple to solve in terms of U. If you give me V, I can compute you very easily by simply dividing A by KV. But now you see the idea, it's like a chicken and egg problem or a fixed point equation. Now you solve for U and then you solve for V, of course, and then you solve for U and then you solve for V, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And you hope it converges. And, and this is one of the reasons why I call this actually Syncorn algorithm. It has many names, it has several Wikipedia pages and a lot of rediscovery in the history of science. It's because Syncorn is a mathematician uh, that proved convergence. So it's why. Uh, I credit uh, this, uh, I would say, silicon discovery, not because he discovered the algorithm, of course. I think you know, no, no, no one discovered it. It's like super, super old. But he's the one that studied this in theory. So it says several, several people have, have proved convergence, but he's the one that really proved uh, fast convergence or linear convergence uh, toward the solution. So it's nice, it converges. And the proof of silicon, to for those who want to know the mathematics, is beautiful because it's, it's based on the same exact proof as the proof of convergence of Markov chain. In fact, if, if there was no division, it would just be a Markov chain. You would keep, keep multiplying by K, and, and probably you know this famous theorem of Peron frobenus that says that the Markov chain converges geometrically toward the, the eigenvector, toward its unique positive eigenvector. And it's exactly the same here, because the same proof works. Even if there is a division, it's magic, the same proof works. So in terms of mathematics, it's, it's very simple. It's the same very old proof. But it's easy to say it now. At the time, it was really a big breakthrough. So uh, the other thing that is very nice is uh, that the algorithm is super easy to implement on GPUs, on graphical processor unique, units, sorry, uh, because it's just matrix vector multiplication. It's very simple to implement first, and, and it, it works extremely well on GPU. So really, the game changer is if you want to implement this on GPU, it works like a good like charm. Um, OK, I don't want to insist on this, but this really is the main, uh, the main idea. Is, is the complexity of Syncon is basically n squared because each iteration is like multiplication by this uh, Gibbs kernel. All right, so this is about what I want to say about the algorithm. I hope you see uh, how much enthusiastic I am about this very simple algorithm and it really works great. I would just like flash a few, um, is there any questions? Sorry, I need to. Oh, it's a great question. Actually, it's non-trivial. So Marco Couturier has a very nice paper on a fast, or I would say, he calls this differentiable sorting, where he used Syncon to, uh, to do the sorting. The problem is as soon as epsilon is, is trivially positive, you don't get the bijection because you get a bit of diffusion. So what people do usually, is if they compute like some notion of a conditional mean to, to see where it goes. And um, it's not clear what's happened. In, in particular, it's not always true that it will be monotonic, although it's very hard to find counter example. So I have no answer to give you. Actually, it's a very interesting question of what happened to the sorting when you smooth it. Because you see that when you sort values, you get possibly non-differentiability because you could have two values at the same position. Uh, so somehow smoothing uh, by, by entropy is, uh, is a great idea. But to the best of my knowledge, there is very little theory about what it does, except the fact that it introduces a smooth way of, uh, of sorting. Because really, one idea that maybe I didn't insist too much 
but really uh, it's the idea of additive entropy smoothing everything so it gets like differentiable functions and so on. Great question once again. The syncorn uh, corresponds to alternating projections. I didn't discuss it, but yes, exactly. So a way to interpret syncorn here I presented it uh, using like a fixed point uh, intuition because I felt it simpler. But another way to think about this is that you get two constraints, the one on A and the one on B, and syncorn corresponds to alternatingly projecting your kernel on A and B, on the two constraints. And it's a projection, it's not the Euclidean projection, it's projection for the Kullback metric. Back labor, so the relative entropy. And, 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 and this is actually useful to show convergence. So it's another way to prove convergence, not the same as syncorn. It provides, a, as I would say, a classical uh, optimization convergence, a slow convergence rate, but that gives a be much better constraint, con constant, sorry. So actually, it's, uh, it's what is used, this uh, idea of interpreting syncorn as alternative projection to get this bond that I put here that n squared divided by epsilon iteration are needed if you want to reach uh, epsilon accuracy. So this is like another way to interpret syncorn. There's many, actually it's an algorithm you can interpret by, by many, many, many ways. Each way brings a new intuition and new properties. Um, so yes and not. So how the dimension is involved in the problem, it's hidden here because the dimension is hidden in the cost. Okay, so of course, if you change the dimensionality, the property of the cost will change and it will, in, it will impact the convergence speed. Okay, in fact, the convergence speed depends on the kernel, depends on the values of the kernel in theory and in practice. So of course, in fact, the dimension enters. It doesn't, it doesn't enter directly in terms of complexity because here I assume that God or someone has given me direct access to the cost. But for instance, if you are in very high dimension, even estimating the cost, so filling this matrix capital K might be costly because you need to compute this Gaussian kernel. So in terms of computation time, it's like pre-processing if you want. Like you need to evaluate the, the kernel. You also get like a method, like uh, a very interesting code that was released by uh, Jean Fedi, which is called Keops. I will give the link uh, later that compute on the fly uh, the kernel to avoid storing the kernel. It has a cost because if you are in high dimension, uh, even evaluating the kernel has a cost. But here I'm, I'm like evacuating this question. I assume that someone uh, gives me direct access to the cost and I have this uh, theorem of convergence. But of course, it, it's, it's, it's important because it costs you to evaluate the cost in high dimension. And also the, the value of the, of the kernel will change if you are in high dimension and the convergence might be slower. Okay. So yes, it's, it plays a huge role. And for instance, for the convergence proof here to, to, to old, actually, uh, I assume my data is on a compact space. So if you are in high dimension, uh, well, you can always say it's a compact space because you are in finite dimension, but if the dimension increases, uh, it starts to be questionable. So, and, and the speed actually depends on the radius of your space. So, yeah. So, uh, actually, yes. I mean, in fact, uh, as I said before, it's even simpler than, uh, than Pishman Radford. So, yeah, you can view as Pishman Radford, I think, is. Um, so, you could view this as just alternating uh, optimization. In which case, uh, you don't really need to speak about uh, advanced, uh, like Douglas Rashford or ADMM. Some people have tried ADMM also on Syncorn. So there's been many, many, many algorithms that have been tried to improve over Syncorn. And in some cases, it actually improves. Um, so the answer, I'm not sure I answer correctly, but yes, there is a link, but the link is very simple. It's just alternating projection. And since the space are affine, uh, actually, alternating projection is, is, a, is, a, is a valid algorithm that is very simple. But if you go to more complex problems, uh, you might need to, that are not just like classical optimal transform, you might need to use uh, like uh, ADMM or, or Douglas Rashford or actually Dijkstra's algorithm and so on. But there, they, here it's like actually a very, very, very simple algorithm. All right. Um, I wanted just to, to flash a few extensions since I'm a, I'm a bit late. I will just mention them. So one extension is the completion of Barry Center. You have several input measures and you want to compute like an average. It's very nice work by Guillaume and Marshall Aguet. So Marshall died a few years ago uh, from cancer, actually. And we are also very sad of this loss. He was a very important researcher in the field, one of the key players. And with Guillaume, they introduced this very nice idea. And I don't have time to describe, but you can also use similar algorithm, synchron algorithm to compute uh, Barry Center. And there's many, many other extensions uh, I don't have time to cover, but uh, we worked on unbalanced optimal transport where you can also have a variation in terms of mass and, and so on. Um, let me just add a few words on, 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 on practical issues, I would say, which is the fact that since you have in, induced or increased 
the cost by some entropy. Actually, it's not anymore a distance. And it's even worse than this. If you look at the optimal alpha, the one that is the closest from your, from your input, if epsilon goes to plus infinity, you would see that the optimal alpha shrugs toward uh, the mean of the distribution. So you see it's a fairly bad effect. It's not only it's not a distance, but it's actually a very, very poor distance as or a very, very poor notion of proximity as epsilon increases. So what we worked on in uh, during the PhD work of Ojun Veng, which was actually an idea that was introduced before by several authors, is to remove this problem by subtracting one half, actually, of the costs of the Schrodinger cost somehow between alpha and itself and beta and itself. And we call this a synchron divergence. Uh, it's not anymore a distance, but it has a nice effect that when alpha is beta, of course, now it's zero. So you, you've canceled the, the problem you have at zero or when alpha is equal to beta. But since you've introduced negative sign, you might be worried that it's actually doing something that's very good. So this has been a, a subject of intense work in several years, actually, to, to answer the question, is it positive? And the answer is under some condition on the cost, uh, we could prove that it's actually positive. For instance, if the cost is Euclidean cost, we proved it uh, together with Jean, Jean Fedi and, uh, and Thibault, this journey, who would defend his PhD in two days, which actually was a very productive PhD. He proved this theorem, but many more results. And something else, I mean, something that actually was noticed uh, by several people, uh, but, but it's interesting to see that in some cases, you could actually say more than just it's a distance. You can say what happened at least in the limits, and we have been working hard recently to understand I mean, the properties of, of this limit when epsilon goes to zero and when epsilon goes to plus infinity. So when epsilon goes to zero, uh, you recover optimal transport, of course, because it's designed for this. <laughs> Obviously, we at least we we we, we see this, and it, it has been studied, for instance, by Christian Leonard, and there is a whole community in large deviations that studies this type of limit. And here is just a very simple limit, but then you can do a Taylor expansion, try to compute what are actually the other term if you expand this function in terms of epsilon. So this has been uh, also a lot of work uh, ongoing in the recent uh, last few, few years. A lot of progress has been made, and I don't have time to explain this. And the other limit that is interesting is epsilon goes to plus infinity because it allows me to, to connect with a very nice and very fruitful body of works on Euclidean distance. So it's actually much simpler than optimal transport. So maybe I could have started with this. What are Euclidean distance between probability distribution? Of course, you cannot just use the L2 distance because L2 distance is not defined between Dirac. You cannot say my Dirac has the L2 norm of blah, blah, blah. It's plus infinity. So you need to smooth uh, the L2 norm to introduce what are called kernels method or kernel norms, which are often called uh, maximum mean discrepancies in statistics. So it's been introduced or at least uh, championed uh, by Arthur Gretton in, uh, in London. And if you think about just histograms that you could generalize to arbitrary vector, it's just like cooking up some, some valid metric, call it M, between, between vectors, probability vectors. Uh, they call this MMD, but it has a lot of, 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 of connection with kernels method and so on. So, you, so, so as epsilon goes to plus infinity, what you do is simply computing a Euclidean distance between your histograms. And the kernel you're using to compute this Euclidean distance, actually it's quite funny, is simply minus the distance to the power p. So the question is, when is it the case that minus the distance to the power p is actually a valid kernel? When is it the case that this quantity is actually positive? And it turned out that, for instance, if, if d is Euclidean distance and p uh, is between 0 and 2, it's actually true. It's a, it's a positive distance, which looks super weird because there is a minus sign. So you might say, OK, there is a minus sign in, in, in front of, of the metric. Capital M is defined with a minus sign. So how come it could be positive? Well, you, you have to, there is a trick, of course. The trick is A and B, they are probability vector. So you are subtracting two vectors of mass 1. So this gives you a vector of 0 mean. So it's not classical positivity. It's positivity under the hypothesis that your vector has 0 mean, often called conditionally positive uh, kernels. And the theorem, it's a famous theorem, that uh, Euclidean distance is actually a positive negative kernel. So if you put a minus sign, it becomes positive. And it has a very nice uh, name. It's called energy distance kernel or Kramer norms. Once again, you get a Wikipedia page. So if you look on Wikipedia for energy distance, it's a fantastic distance. Actually, it, may, it should be, I think, the favorite kernels of everyone because it's so powerful. Much, it's much better than, than a Gaussian kernel. It's much easier. It works really great. Um, and, and, uh, and uh, well, I would say it's a serious competitor for optimal transport. I would say in practice, optimal transport tends to work better for many applications, but it's much slower to compute. Okay, so kernel norms, especially this energy distance, is a fantastic uh, tool. So you should use, if you have never used it, 
it's definitely simpler. But it doesn't have this nice geometry uh, structure. For instance, it's an Euclidean norm. So if you define barycenter according to this Euclidean norm, it's just going to be the very dumb barycenter. So there is no transport at, at all. Um, uh, it's too technical for me. So I would, sorry, so there is a question about connection to information, sorry, which is not at all my field. Uh, I would be tempted to say probably because uh, Syncon appears at many areas of, uh, I would say, information theory uh, and, uh, and, and channel coding. So it might be the case. So in particular, Syncon appears very naturally in message passing algorithm on graph, Viterbo uh, decoding algorithm is, is connected to Syncon if you add entropy to the problem. So you can find Syncon algorithm in many aspects of, uh, of decoding on channels and stuff. So, but I have no answer for you. Uh, but, uh, but there is a definitely a strong connection between Syncon and many aspects of information theory in general uh, and graphical model also. Uh, is, uh, because there are books written on Syncon actually, uh, not at all connected to open network. Or at least, I mean, it could be connected. If someone could make the link, it would probably lead to very fruitful. Uh, I'm a very, uh, I mean, uh, I strongly support uh, people that would uh, make connection between optimal transport and other things because it's time it's like super fruitful and give a lot of very nice uh, insight okay so let's uh, try to conclude <laughs> at least to, to converge to the to the end of the talk one thing that i want to discuss and it would be my last serious uh, mathematical point is the question of sample complexity or what happened in high dimension and i would not, i have no answer so it's a super complicated question but maybe before like really making a claim on, on machine learning. Let, let's just study what happens if you discretize your problem. Can you even discretize optimal transport? And it's not so clear. So in practice, I mean, in theory, what you would like is to compute some distance between alpha and beta. Let's say it's like densities, whatever, like uniform densities on the cube, for instance. But you only have access to discrete samples, right, in practice. For instance, in, in typical statistical scenario, you draw independently points, and you, you have access to two empirical distribution alpha at and beta at with n samples. And, then, and the question, first question be, before doing anything more complicated is to say, what is the error you're making? And, and the bad news, and it's a very old theorem by Dudley in the 60s, is that the error you're making for, for optimal transport on average is of the order one over n to the power one over d. So it's like fantastically huge error you make. Like if you want to reach some precision uh, delta, the number of samples would grow like one over delta to the power d. So if d is even 10, it's like totally hopeless. Which means that even if this would be cubes, I would have no way to tell a part to cube if I want to use optimal transport if you're in high dimension. Of course, it doesn't work, nothing works because in practice you use models, you introduce, I don't know, machine learning models, and you introduce prior knowledge and stuff. So of course, this is not the end of the story. But it tells you that optimal transport it itself is a seriously difficult and intractable question in the high dimension. It doesn't mean that optimal transport tools are useless, once again. But the question of computing precisely optimal transport distance is not well posed in high dimension. At the other end of the spectrum, if you consider only Euclidean distance, so kernel methods, then somehow computing with alpha hat is very similar to doing like Monte Carlo methods to approximate integral with sums. And as you've been told in high school, or maybe not in high school, but at some point in your career, is that Monte Carlo method, they work in high dimension because their uh, error decays like one over square root of n. Which is a bit cheating, of course, because this hide a lot of constants that might be huge in high dimension. But at least in terms of decay, it's clear that Monte Carlo methods they don't suffer from the curse of dimensionality as opposed to optimal transport. It doesn't mean that Euclidean methods are better than optimal transport because these are two quantities. So it's like comparing, I don't know, two, uh, two, two questions that are unrelated, but it tells you that the two quantities don't behave the same in high dimension. Now, what we did with O during our PhD was to try to see what happened with Syncon, as, as you might guess, since I've told you that Syncon interpolate between the two, you should expect that the behavior in terms of sample complexity also interpolate between the two, which is more or less the take home message of our thesis is that as soon as epsilon is strictly positive, you get a rate that is uh, one over square root of n. So you don't suffer in terms of rate of the curse of dimensionality, but there is no free lunch and you recover the curse of dimensionality in terms of the constant, which blows like epsilon I mean, one over epsilon to the power d or d divided by, d by two, whatever, which means that at the end of the day, you cannot really use Syncon to, to estimate optimal transport in high dimension. Because of course, if you want to do this, if like 
n increases, you would need epsilon to decrease because you want more precision, and epsilon will scale like one over n to some nasty power, and you would get back the curse of dimensionality, which we knew from the start because actually it's, a, it's actually a theorem that's that one over n to the power one over d in general is not you cannot improve over it. It's like minimax optimal. You cannot have a method, uh, whatever algorithm you use, it would improve over it. So the claim is not that SimCon is a way to compute optimal control in high dimension. The claim is that SimCon defines something. We don't really know whether, I mean, it's not clear what are the probabilities of this something. It behaves like optimal control, let's say, that could be estimated in high dimension. And the question is, what will you do with it? I mean, can you use it for downstream tasks, for clustering, for classification, whatever, where it would be useful? And there is no theory for that. But in terms of estimation, I would say there is some hope. But really, I think the goal, the ultimate goal in life should not be to, to, to optimize optimal control per se. It should be to solve some um, concrete task. And this mathematician uh, you know, has no, no real clue. So what are these I mean, downstream tasks that people are dreaming, uh, dreaming about and uh, that mathematician cannot really answer? I would say typically they correspond to what people would call generative models. So I already explained this. I mean, the, the key idea of trying to, to find pa optimal parameters Classical statistical method, they would form the maximum likelihood uh, estimators, uh, which roughly speaking is the same as minimizing a relative entropy, I would say, between uh, the data and the model. But the problem is the logarithm of zero. I mean, this is, is obvious, but when you compute the log of, I mean, you estimate the log of a probability, you see that there may be some issue. So the issue comes if, if, the, if the models, I mean, have shifts, like if it's supported on some surfaces that would shift, you see that you would have zeros and you would start to have problems. So there are some questions where maximum likelihood is not defined and you need to somehow regularize the maximum likelihood. And the typical scenarios that people are trying to solve in, uh, in deep learning generative models is to have densities or distribution uh, alpha that would be described by uh, through uh, sampling in a latent space. So you sample your data in a latent space and then you send them in high dimension uh, using uh, typically a deep network. And you see that this race question because you cannot define a maximum likelihood estimator in this case, you need to smooth it. And one possibility, uh, the dream, one dream I would say, is to use optimal transport to define this estimator. So you replace the maximum likelihood or the, max, the relative entropy by some notion of optimal transport. And why not? I mean, it, it makes sense. Uh, this, I, would, I would skip this, but this is just to, to mention the type of architecture people have been using, but it's not really the the focus of the talk, so they would use like generative uh, neural networks that goes from the latent space to the high dimensional space of image or text or whatever. Uh, and the training is usually done through uh, stochastic gradient descent with uh, by propagating through the, through the loss function. And let me state it up front that there is no theory. So here, uh, there is no theory that guarantees that uh, LZD should converge on this case because typically your gradient is biased and you don't know where it converges. So it's, it's, it's people are using it, but, but there is an absolutely no uh, theory backing up uh, the convergence of this type of method, or at least like vanilla method, they, 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 you can even prove they don't converge to the good solution. It's just a computational graph for those who are interested. It's not really important. It's just like classical, you, you code it in PyTorch and it, it works great. I mean, it's, it gives results. Um, it gives nice results for low dimensional, like MNIST data set, it works great. But if you start using it, uh, out of the shelf for like even like simple uh, celeb uh, data sets, uh, it doesn't work great. And the reason is because you, you don't want to use the L2 distance. I mean, for now, I've, I've, I've been very vague about what distance you should use. So the way you should implement this, of course, is not by using the L2 distance, it's by also using a no, another neural network, which people would call it adversarial. So it's really similar to the generative adversarial network of, of Good Goodfellows and collaborators. But you would train another network to actually implement the cost using optimal transport. And then the idea of, 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 of GAN is to train these two networks in an adversarial way. It would mean that one network would be generative, so it would be optimized to minimize the optimal transport distance, and the other one will be discriminative, and it would be trained to maximize, on contrary, to discriminate between the two point clouds, the true data set and the fake data set. And uh, you can see the problem is now it's not anymore a convex optimization problem. It becomes a, a non-convex uh, min gam min max uh, game problem, and it's very very hard to, to say anything like this. But well, one motivation is, is at least one motivation you could view as coming from minimizing an optimal transport loss, which is, is nice. Uh, but there is no absolutely no theory. And this is I mean one of the videos. It's not my team, of course. Uh, I mean of course. It requires, I would say, uh, quite intensive use of GPUs. 
uh, and it produces nice animation, but it's not optimal transport. I mean, it's just the fact that neural networks encode some, some geometry of the faces, and then we don't really understand what happens. Yeah, so there are, actually there have been some very nice work recently by people at Facebook, like uh, Amos uh, team, that actually design a specific solver for optimal transport on geodesic space. Because, I mean, you could just encode the distance, but it's not to be very slow. So they have a nice solver, and, and they apparently have, have application of this, of like computing optimal transport by to embed, for instance, point in a geodesic space. It could be just a sphere, but it could be more complex geodesic space. Um, so it's possible. I, I'm not really a specialist of this, but uh, we did some numerics for, for like application for brain mapping. So estimation, estimation of activity on the brain, which in this case was a 2D, so it's a low dimensional 2D, sur, sur, I mean, 2D surface in 3D. But in this case, we use like uh, we actually computed the we actually computed the geodesic. I mean, some approximation of the geodesic. We have some paper on this uh, where we use actually uh, what is called geodesic in heat. So like uh, heat diffusion on the manifold to implement Tinkon algorithm I means quite efficiently on, on, on triangulated surfaces. So we, I would say it's possible, but it's certainly more comp more com more computationally intensive than on the classical Euclid in this space. Okay, so I have more than, uh, uh, sorry, I, to, I spoke too much, as usual. Uh, so I think optimal transport, as you might say, I'm very enthusiastic by it, by, because it has a long mathematical history, lots of mathematical, uh, I would say, theorems, and, and, and through the history, you can see improvements. I spoke a lot about Kantorovich and, and Dominic, but, but let's not forget, like, Jan Brunier, a French mathematician, so I should cite uh, Jan Brunier's work that discovered, like, really nice theory of optimal transport, and then there was... Uh, follow-up uh, theory by, by Cédric Villani, who now is uh, almost elected. And we'll see next week if he's elected because he's running for re-election next week. So we also can get to politics after doing optimal transport. And uh, Alessio Figali, who won the Fino medals uh, four years ago for contribution on optimal transport. Uh, but all this is very theoretical contribution that discard the, I mean, one key aspect, which is the high dimensionality. Like what's happened in high dimension? In theory, uh, people put it on those, on those carpets. It's like, well, dimension is just a constant and we don't care. Whereas I think for people in machine learning, dimension is the most important parameter. So for mathematicians, dimension is not really, I mean, unless there is some specific thing that happens, they are not really looking at how the constant evolves with the dimension, whether we actually care about this more than anything else. So this somehow raised new mathematical questions, which I think are super interesting. So I hope uh, mathematical people, they would like study it more seriously. <laughs> Let's put it like this. And also it has tons of new applicative questions, which I think are more important. Uh, it has been mentioned how do you compute on geodesic space, but you could also say that, like, I mean, there's many problems where it's not even clear where the data set belongs, is it the geodesic space and so on. So could we learn the metric, which is one thing that I spoke a bit. Also there are some cases where in fact, the data set even don't belong to the same space. This is an example I'm very excited about, which is application for genomics. Uh, single cell genomics where you record for each cell. So it's really fantastic tools. They record like millions of cells and for each cell, they have access to genomic profiles. Uh, but sometimes you have like data that belong, I mean, that have been recorded with different machinery, different technologies and belong somehow to different spaces. And you can also have data set that evolve in time because you do like a biopsy and you record cells in time at different times and you want to, to put them together. So for me, it's like almost like Schrodinger problems except it appears in real life. So Schrodinger problem, okay, it's like uh, some question from statistical physics, but, but it's not a question that people would solve in practice, at, at least that I'm aware of. But here it's the same as Schrodinger, except particles of gas, they are replaced by cells and they really exist. And, and you need to go understand this if you want to cure like diseases to understand what happened with cells that degenerate and so on. So it's really a, a tool that is like, well, optimal transport is almost in the problem by definition. So I think it's a great avenue to understand how to put together cells that belongs to different space of genes, different peoples. So each people, you could imagine the space of gene is slightly different and so on. And there are some tools that have been introduced in part by, uh, by Misha Gromov in mathematics, but also by Facundo Memoli, who is the one of the foundation, uh, foundational uh, paper on, on optimal transport uh, and extension, which, which extend optimal transport to the case where the data is not in the same spaces. But the issue is now the problem becomes much more complex because it becomes NPR. So for those who know about like this type of assignment problem, it becomes typically a quadratic assignment problem where it's very, very hard to, to, to say anything. And I think it's like the next uh, frontier is, is studying new problems 
where uh, the optimization problem is not just a linear function, it's, it's like a nonlinear function. And you would still want to say things, and it's not so clear. Like Brownian's theorems, Villani's theorems, uh, nothing is known uh, outside of this uh, vanilla setup. Okay, so I hope uh, I've convinced you that it's a super nice area of research and people should uh, embrace it and use it as much as possible. Uh, thanks a lot. And if you have a question, uh, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel, for your very comprehensive and excellent talk. Actually, we had many interactions uh, along your talk. This is good. And we have some more questions. Uh, let me check. Uh, question, do you know if optimal transportation is becoming a hot topic again in application of sustainability resource allocation? Um, I think so. I think people are starting to rediscover this, uh, in particular in, for modern AI problems, which are like super expensive in terms of, of energy consumption and allocation of, uh, of various, uh, various computational uh, uh, resources. I think it starts to use like modern optimal transport tools and, and, and new ideas. Uh, I've seen a few papers on this. Another area, which is not exactly what you mentioned, but is on, on fairness and, and understanding the bias in algorithm. I think people are also using optimal transport to compare uh, models or data sets and try to assess fairness. So there is a bit of a revival in, uh, in the use of, uh, of, of transportation to tackle old or not so old problems. Okay. Uh, there is another question actually in another chat box. Actually, you already replied, but uh, could you please elaborate more uh, about some interesting future directions for ah, yeah. transport in machine learning? Oh, there, I mean, there are a few ones that seem super interesting that I'm not uh, following everything yes. because there's many papers. Uh, one, I mean, one, of course, very important question is the interface with deep learning, as you might guess. <coughs> and there are a few papers that have tried to apply uh, deep learning technique in optimal transport, so somehow to modify or to introduce uh, transport uh, to replace transport map or uh, before uh, if you follow my talks in Syncon there was the U and the V so maybe I could come back to this equation uh, I didn't insist too much but the U and the V they play a very important role so for Leonid Kantorovich it was called dual potential and they correspond to price on the markets but you could try to find them using like deep networks to accelerate the algorithm or to have like new properties I don't know and there have been some fantastic work recently try to use it. So I think it's interesting to see uh, what comes next and introducing uh, like progressively, we see like deep learning and optimal transport that are mixing more and more together. And uh, in Chimac, I think there would be like new architecture coming out of it that could be used for optimal transport or that could be used for non-optimal transport, but get inspired by optimal transport. Something that I've been involved also a bit, and I'm a huge supporter, is op using optimal transport inside transformers, for instance, which are new architecture, or not so new actually, but architecture which are not conv convolutional networks that operate by attention uh, layers. And you can really view attention layers as being kind of a couplings between, I mean, if you think about self-attention, it's a coupling between you and yourself, or cross attention is coupling between two, two data. And uh, you could use SyncCon inside, so you we introduce SyncCon and this modifies the, the attention mechanism. So I think there is also a nice connection between um, this and, uh, and, and, and optimal transport. More generally, I mean, connected to this is the idea of, of very deep architecture that operate by uh, like evolving some data in, through the layers. So dynamical systems, basically, dynamical systems uh, are very, I mean, you could use optimal transport to describe evolution of, of, of particles, for instance, either as a theoretical tool or a numerical tool. So there's been also a lot of progress in uh, mathematical progress and, and numerical progress on using optimal transport to uh, monitor or to optimize or to improve evolution of, of points in time uh, could be for various applications. I've spoken already about like cells, like modeling the evolution of cells in time, I think very interesting, or of, of people that move in time. Another thing that uh, come to my mind that is also super interesting is totally theoretical, so there's no application, but it's to study the training dynamics of neural networks, where you view, um, you view uh, neurons as points, and they evolve in time during the training and you can show it's connected to equation of optimal transport. So this is also uh, interesting. It's not really, uh, at least up to now, it's not really used for practical reasons. It's more, mostly to try to understand the convergence property of training of neural networks. So uh, there's many, and it's quite fascinating to see so many new things uh, totally, I mean, connected, half connected and half like, totally disparate. Uh, yes, yes, you have a two other questions. One is about the geometric data normalization. 
Is it required? Uh, yeah, prior so it's a tough question. It's a tough question. So data normalization is a tough question. So, so first of all, so it's about trying to de design the metric. I mean, normalization of the point is a bit the same as, as how do you design the metric, and there should be some normalization, some prior normalization, because otherwise it doesn't work so well. Also, normalization in terms of total mass, because you might have point clouds with not the same number of points. So you could say, okay, let's let's do nothing. Let's just like make the total mass to one. I think it's not a good idea. So what we have been advocating is rather like integrating this into the optimization problem, what we call unbalanced optimal transport, which is a way to say some data, so maybe some points you don't want to transport them, and maybe you, you can like remove them automatically. And I, I strongly advise uh, using this type of uh, robust optimal transport. Uh, but yeah, you're right that uh, there is no automatic method, of course, to normalize the data. If you have a lot of data set, you could use like some, some neural network training to normalize it for you, but, but it's not to be, uh, to be difficult. Um, there is one another one. Yes. About the... Yep. Is so there, there a closed form expression highlight like the dimension? So in 1D, you're right, there is a closed form expression because optimal transport is exactly the same as computing a cumulative or what are called quantile functions. So optimal transport in 1D is just computing quantile function. It's very easy. But as you might guess, in 2D, I mean, there is no canonical quantile function and it doesn't work. The only case for which there is a closed form is the case of Gaussian distribution, in which case you can compute the optimal transport in closed form. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there is uh, little hope. In fact, optimal transport is very hard. Just in 2D, it's already like super hard to to see what's happening. It's not, 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 uh, not okay. So the answer is besides the Gaussian case or like close to I mean, Gaussian or similar to Gaussian distribution where the transport is actually a linear function. So basically if the transport is a linear function then usually you can compute it in close form. But the only case uh, are like very simple uh, Gaussian type of distribution. Okay, any more questions from the attendees? Mm, it seems no. Okay, so uh, okay, so maybe you are going to, get to the end of the seminar. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank once again, uh, Dr. Gabriel Peher for this uh, excellent talk. And actually, we recorded this talk and it will be uh, available in a TII YouTube channel very soon. Okay. So uh, for those uh, who were not able to attend, please uh, uh, check out uh, the, our YouTube channel, okay? To see again or to disseminate this very interesting talk. Okay, so thank you very much once again. Okay. Thank you all uh, for our attendees, okay? See you, every, see you all. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for hosting the, the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Yeah, see you, everyone. Bye. Bye.